Uh, thank you, Dr. Agawa and Dr. Brunt for the privilege of presenting here today. And that was a very nice segue into my talk. Uh, I have no financial disclosures, but I do have a personal disclosure which I think is going to influence this talk a little bit. And that is that I do not believe that cholecystectomy is a simple procedure. And I approach every case as an advanced biliary procedure, and at times I'm then surprised with how easy it can actually be. And I think that this is an important distinction in the way that we think about cholecystectomy, because it's going to always keep safety at the forefront. This is a picture, and again, this is sort of how I think about cholecystectomy. Remember, as was discussed uh, earlier, there's about 750,000 cholecystectomies performed just in the United States a year, and with a bile duct injury rate of a conservative number of about 0.4, that's about one in every 300 cases there's a risk for a bile duct injury. So those 299 other cases may seem routine and simple, but it's that one case we have to protect ourselves for. So we always have to be cognizant that danger is around the corner at any time and keep safety always at the forefront of what we're doing. I'm going to discuss a little bit about the exit strategies when you encounter the difficult gallbladder. I'm going to talk about when and how to convert to open cholecystectomy as sort of a lost art. And I want to provide some practical tips to help you make a difficult situation a little bit easier. I'm stealing this from Dr. Stralsberg, but if you've ever heard him speak on the, the simple method to handle a difficult gallbladder, simply do not. And I think that this is something that's worth considering. Is there a way that we can avoid these situations in the first place? We know some well-defined risk factors for, diff for difficult operative conditions or for risk factors for severe inflammation. Some of these are well-defined, such as age over 65, male sex, multiple episodes of chronic cholecystitis, acute cholecystitis with duration over 72 to 96 hours, any evidence of gangrene or necrosis of the gallbladder wall, previous biliary tree manipulation by other percutaneous cholecystostomy tubes, transhepatic biliary drainage catheters, and endoscopic biliary procedures. And you have to always be worried about the Maritzi syndrome of a cholecystoenteric fistula or a gallbladder cancer in some of these cases. So these are cases that you may consider ahead of time saying to yourself, are these cases that I'm comfortable taking on? Do these cases need to be performed at this time? And if I am comfortable and I can perform these cases safely, recognize that this could be a very difficult case. So when you do find yourself in the operating room, and as we all do in these difficult operative conditions, what's the best option? And I think what we need to discuss a lot in this talk is the idea of just simply bailing out. And what does that mean? Well, you have to ask yourself a few questions. Can you simply just stop the operation? Can you live to fight another day? I know this is not something that surgeons necessarily are agreeable to, but this is a good option here. Just stop the operation, place the patient on antibiotics, and take that patient back in three months for a definitive cholecystectomy. The other option is simply draining the gallbladder. Can you do a surgical cholecystostomy tube? Can you stop the operation and do a percutaneous cholecystostomy tube if you're not comfortable doing this surgically? Again, this is a temporizing measure that may require definitive operative intervention in three months or so after this procedure. But I think the real question is, is there an effective definitive solution that still remains safe and can prevent biliary injury? And for this talk, I think we need to discuss, does this need to be done open or can this be done laparoscopically? I think What's the reason it's so important to have a definitive method in this situation? Well, we have to understand what our motives are. Our motives are we want to fix a problem and we want to keep patients safe. And in some of these cases, these two motives may be in tension with each other. And in a case like this, if you continue to persist to perform a total cholecystectomy in order to, i.e., fix the problem, a bile duct injury may occur. So we've defined this uh, recently in terminology, but the subtotal fenestrating cholecystectomy has been around for well over 100 years. It's a very standardized and safe operation that was performed very often in the open air. This was very popularized by the cirrhotic patients in the, in the 1980s. And as you can see in this illustration, the general goal of a fenestrating cholecystectomy is to remove the anterior wall of the gallbladder leaving an area of the infundibulum intact so as to not enter the hepatoduodenal ligament. And we call this the shield of McElmoyle. You can leave the posterior gallbladder attached or you can remove it down to a portion close to uh, the infundibulum. 
The idea here is to simply not attempt to ligate the cystic duct from outside the gallbladder. And if you see there's some bilious leakage, when you open the gallbladder up fully, you can actually suture ligate the internal orifice of the cystic duct through the open gallbladder wall. Again, never making an attempt to ligate anything externally. So this is a fairly straightforward operation. What I think is much, much more difficult is deciding when this operation needs to be done. What are the stop points during a difficult cholecystectomy? And I often say I think the when is much harder than the how. Does this differ for different skill sets and exp uh, experience levels? This talk here with advanced laparoscopists in the audience is maybe a little bit different than if we're giving this talk at the American College. The goal obviously is going to be to stop biliary injury before it happens. But we also have to weigh the risk of performing too many unnecessary bailout procedures versus bile duct injury. So what are some things you should be looking out for during a, uh, during a laparoscopic cholecystectomy? Well, I think, I think some obvious evidence of trouble ahead is going to be the perforated gallbladder, a pericholecystic abscess, a gangrenous or necrotic gallbladder, as Nate showed there, uh, or the hidden gallbladder, the gallbladder that takes 20 minutes and you can't even find it. Here's a quick video. Sorry. Sorry about that. Here's a quick video where this is an obvious case. You can see there's a pericholecystic abscess. The fundus of the gallbladder actually had, had ruptured here. The mucosal, the subserosal area of the gallbladder is necrotic. You can see there's no way we're ever going to see the base of the gallbladder in a case like this. We actually enter the gallbladder and get a rush of purulent bilious fluid. This is a case that you know very quickly in an operation that you're not going to be doing a total cholecystectomy or especially not laparoscopically. So that's obvious. I think the, the more subtle signs can be quite dangerous. And so what are some of the things you need to be looking out for? Well, I think woody, fibrotic, inflammatory rind around the bottom end of the gallbladder is a very dangerous sign and something that everybody needs to be very aware of. Because these are, this, this type of rind is something that you can generally work within. You can make some progress. And you may get lulled into thinking that you're making progress when, in fact, you're getting closer to bile duct injury. I think the inability to elevate the infundibulum away from the hepatoduodenal ligament or movement of the entire hepatoduodenal ligament when you're retracting the gallbladder is, again, another sign, something that you need to be worried about. If there's an inflammatory mass in or by the hepatoduodenal ligament or if there's a large impacted stone at the infundibulum, these are all things that you need to be aware of. Here's another video. In this case, we actually dissected the majority of the gallbladder away from the liver. Here in the back, you can see the cystic plate well exposed. But what you're seeing as we get down to the bottom end of the gallbladder here is that there's clearly a, a stone that's impacted. And I don't know if it picks up well in the video, but you can see that none of this tissue is moving very freely at all. And this is a very dangerous sign. And here as the video stops, you can sort of get a sense as to what Dr. Dezeal said again, that look where we are in the line of Rivier sulcus. It's a little bit lower here, but we're very close to being unsafe and dissecting in the hepatoduodenal ligament. This is a case where even though you may think you're able to get a total cholecystectomy, you may want to uh, avoid doing that here. So again, I think this decision is very, very difficult to make. And I think there's a, a topic that we all need to study more as to really what are some of the signs when we need to stop. But once you have made that decision based on your own comfort level, then you have to choose what are you going to do. And we think that a fenestrating subtotal cholecystectomy may be the best definitive option here. And then we need to ask that question, can this be done laparoscopically or must it be done via an open operation? So as with any procedure, as you're all very well aware of, surgeon comfort and experience is obviously the most important factor here. But an important point in the difficult gallbladder is an open procedure is not often easier. And in fact, it still may require a bailout I think this is a very important, oh, I'm sorry, this is a very important point that the difficult gallbladder is difficult either if done laparoscopically or open. And so we must be very aware when this situation occurs 
that total cholecystectomy may not be the best option here. The best data we have to support the use of subtotal cholecystectomy is a systematic review and meta-analysis out of JAMA Surgery in 2015. And I know this is a busy slide, but I want to take your eyes down to the bottom here where it's compares, comparing laparoscopic and open subtotal cholecystectomies. And what you can see here is the majority of perioperative complications are, are similar between the two groups, but there is an increased risk of bile leakage in the laparoscopic group at 30% versus the open group of 6%. And I, I suspect that this is some difficulty in suturing laparoscopically. But what's also very interesting here is you can see in, in over 600 cases, there's no bile duct injury. So this is a very important point. So when do I think it's important to consider converting to an open procedure? Well, I think the big one for the majority of folks in this audience are probably gonna be in, in the need for improved suturing. Uh, if that's necessary for the case. I think if there's bleeding that is either uh, very brisk or bleeding that is difficult for you to control or bleeding that keeps getting in your visualization, this may be another reason to convert. I think the other uh, reasonable option would be need for tactile feedback. Um, and, and obviously sometimes just using your hands can definitely help you un get a sense of the situation a little bit better. And again, I think frustration or lack of progress is another good reason. I would, I would recommend consider calling for help in these situations as another set of experience. Hands and eyes may just help you be able to retract better or get through the operation. But again, this is definitely a clear reason to convert. What I wanna talk about with an open cholecystectomy is understanding, again, the goal should probably be to start as a subtotal cholecystectomy. And there are certainly cases where you can complete and do a total cholecystectomy once you convert to open, but I think that's the first uh, choice that you wanna make. And again, the hardest part is deciding to do it. You know, I think if you commit earlier, the less stressful it will be in the, in the operation, but again, treat either as an open or laparoscopic case is a very complex case here. I'm just gonna quickly discuss the laparoscopic subtotal and then move on to open. But when I do one of these cases, I, I, I ask the team to get my complicated gallbladder stuff. I think extra ports may be necessary. I love the use of advanced energies, specifically ultrasonic shears seem to work very well for this procedure. If the argon beam coagulating device is close by, I'll bring it in. I always bring extra endocatch bags into the room because I think this is an important point. I get the best optics we have available another suction irrigator close by and some laparoscopic needle drivers and order dinner because of course it's always at seven o'clock at night when these cases seem to occur. In this video, I'll just quickly point out some of the tenets of doing a subtotal cholecystectomy in a fenestrating fashion. Make an incision in the anterior wall of the gallbladder it can be done either longitudinally or transversely, whichever your choice is, but very far away from the infundibulum. Then what I like to do is sort of open the gallbladder anteriorly in such a way that we sort of keep the stones in the, in the position they're in until we wish to remove them. And here, as we remove the stones, you wanna make sure you get everything out of the gallbladder. And you wanna leave that shield of McElm oil close by so that you don't enter the hepatoduodenal ligament. You're then able to retrieve the remainder of the anterior wall of the gallbladder. Next, you're able to fulgrate the posterior wall mucosa. I'm not sure that this is absolutely necessary. I think we always talk about this and it makes us feel better, but it may not be necessary. Here you see there's clearly no bilious drainage at all from uh, the cystic duct orifice, and thus we don't have to suture at all in this case, and we simply left the drain and the patient did okay. In a laparoscopic case, I think it's important for a few tips for success and to alleviate stress is keep track of the pieces of the gallbladder and the large stones. I know this sounds silly, but I'll actually ask the nurses to write this on the board somewhere so that I remember how many pieces or how many stones I have. If there's a very large, small stone burden, I'll actually empty the gallbladder very early in the operation. I may put a Raytex sponge down uh, or put the, all these stones within an endocatch bag early on to prevent uh, and alleviate some of the stress. We talked about the use of uh, ultrasonic shears, and don't be afraid to add extra ports. It's of minimal significance here. And remember, you may not need to suture at all. If you're gonna decide to convert to an open operation, remember there are two well-defined incisions. Uh, the classic subcostal incision on the right side works very well. Also a midline vertical laparotomy in the epigastrum also gives you good access to the gallbladder. 
Uh, one, one note here, this is not the time to skimp on the length of the incision. I know we all fancy ourselves minimally invasive surgeons, but this is not the time to make a small incision because as you all know, visualization is gonna be a little bit more difficult in an open operation than with magnification of laparoscopy. So make an incision that's, that's large enough for you to be able to safely do this operation. Another important point is to definitely use a self-retaining metal retracting system and take a lot of time to set this up correctly. Again, think of this as an advanced biliary procedure. Make sure that you take uh, all of this, the stomach and the colon and the small bowel out of the way. Elevate the liver into the field by putting some packs behind the right hepatic lobe. And a headlight may be useful, again, as visualization is a little bit more difficult in this case. I wanna make one point here. Um, in the majority of the most severe biliary injuries, the so-called vascular biliary injuries, they, in an analysis by Dr. Strausberg, the majority of these cases were actually happened in a laparoscopic converted to open cholecystectomy. And the injury itself occurred during the open portion of that procedure. And what happens is the cystic plate, which is attached to the right portal pedicle, the sheath of the right portal pedicle, actually contracts downward. And so you get a little bit fooled while you're working posterior, posteriorly on the gallbladder where you think you have a few centimeters and in fact you're right into the right portal pedicle. So this is something that's very, very dangerous and something that again makes me often tell people don't consider right away doing a total cholecystectomy when you convert to open because this can happen. There are two techniques, as I think most people recognize, of doing a open total cholecystectomy. A retrograde technique, which is where an incision is made in the peritoneum, the hepatocystic triangle, the, the, the cystic artery and duct are dissected free, and then the gallbladder is separated completely off the liver, and only at that time is uh, ductal uh, identification secured and ligated. This is the type of operation that mimics what we do in the critical view of safety, or said the other way, the critical view of safety is mimicking this technique of secure ductal identification. The anti-grade or dome down approach of total cholecystectomy is, is useful, but again, you must be very, very cautious here to avoid entering into the right portal sheath, and you need to be very careful as you come down. And remember that just as a bile duct injury occurs by a mechanism of misidentification in laparoscopic cholecystectomy, so too can this occur in open. Again, I think the best approach when you have to convert to open is to still perform, at least start, by performing a subtotal cholecystectomy in a fenestrating fashion. It's very easy in an open operation. Just make an incision longitudinally or transversely in the gallbladder, empty out the stones. You can use your finger to identify the end of the infundibulum and then stay away from that region. Resect the remaining portion of the gallbladder and either close the internal orifice of the cystic duct if you see bilious leakage or simply leave a drain. This is just another picture uh, showing the same thing. So in summary, when operative conditions are difficult, consider a bailout to uh, minimize the risk of bile duct injury. And I think this can be safely performed either via an open or laparoscopic technique with appropriate adjustments. Thank you very much for your attention.